Dr. Sobek. Uh, Dr. Sobek has had a variety of experience throughout his career, both academia and professional practice, uh, for which he's been recognized with several international awards. Uh, his engineering firm has offices in Stuttgart, Frankfurt, and New York, and today he'll be presenting sustainable tall buildings, some introductory remarks. Dr. Sobek.
carry to the other ones, which are obviously at that moment totally underloaded. So the question is, how many actuators would you need? Every element in this truss structure should be an actuator, or are there only one or two or five needed? So this is an outcome of a couple of uh, theses done at my institute dissertations, where we clearly could show on the one hand side about the optimum number of actuators and about the weight one could save by introducing such actuators, for example, in simple, simple, simple one span beams. And uh, the result is, for example, for this very trivial example, that you can save weight in the range up to 50 to 60 percent, which is something, especially if we talk about high-rise buildings, where the dead weight is still the governing factor, and where the dead load is far higher than, as the aircraft people would say, than the payload. So it could be very interesting so re to reduce the dead load, which then, of course, helps saving a lot of money, especially in the foundations and the material built into the structure, and which would use, uh, which would uh, reduce the energy needed to produce and to transport those materials in a remarkable way. So, what is the final outcome on what I said? Is this uh, idea of adaptivity, the idea of reducing the weight of material needed to support a structure for any oncoming load and to manipulate the deformations. It could be, for example, shown in a very simple and trivial example, which is a movie. This is the first shot we took, so it looks a little bit like 100 years old, but in fact it's only five or six years old. This is a bridge, a model of a bridge, with a structural height to span ratio of 1 over 600. So normally you would say with a bridge of 1 meter 80 span, with a 300 gram locomotive, which we redesigned a little bit more orthogonalistic so that it looks better would have a ratio of 1 over 12 or 1 over 20. If you would have an engineer doing that with 1 over 100, you would consider him to be keen. We did it here for 1 over 600 in your C. In a normal condition, the locomotive has really problems to get up the hill. But on its way back, look a little bit closer to the locomotive itself. There is no vertical deformation under the wheels of the load. So in that case, the beam is activated. Now on the way to the right, the beam is inactivated, it is passive, and there is a sag of about 70 to 80 millimeters of this 1 meter 80 span. And on the way back, it is activated, and there's a zero deformation below the load. So this is something you cannot do in under normal conditions, because there's always a deformation, even if it might be a very small one, but there is one. So manipulating forces and deformations is one big field of interest and research done at our institute. The other one is rethinking materialities. Of course, there are a lot of people around the world doing a lot of important research in the field of materials, advanced materials, manipulating materials, and so on. What we are working in is just one field, and this is concrete, considered to be a relatively well explored and in the meantime already a little bit boring material. We thought, why is it possible to create a foamed concrete where the bubbles show a certain distribution which directly reflects the internal state of stress, like for example a bone does. Okay, the growth of the bone is a mixture between a DNA coded and a gravity coded thing, but copying this and doing for example a sandwich structure made out of concrete is something not done yet. So we're trying to do that and these are the first outcomes. This is a concrete with a normal high density here, and you see that the porosity is diminished, and over here we have only about 30 to 40 percent of concrete, and the rest is simply air. So if we then double this, you could come up with a sandwich structures for slabs and walls, shear walls, whatever, which have about 30 to 40 percent of the dead weight of a normal concrete. It is, of course, a sandwich structure, but it is a monomaterial sandwich structure. So compared to normal sandwich structures where you have a skin and a core material, and the skin is typically glued to the core material, which then uh, yields to a recycling problem because you have a multi-material composite part of the load-bearing element. In that case, it is what we call a monomaterial element, which reflects directly the state of forces in an optimum way, so it's gaining a lot of weight. Glass. They want to 
research we did is uh, overcoming the problems you have with overhead glazing. Of course, you have to use laminated glass in all those cases, but with the PVB interlayers, especially under higher temperature and a continuous load, you always have problems to show that the overhead glazing really stays in case, in, 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 in place in case one or even two of the sheets broke. What you see here is an uh, experiment we did about seven or eight years ago. And the experiment still stands. In both cases, it is a laminated glass with a PVB interlayer. The first strip of glass fell down after a minute. Both sheets have been broken artificially. The other one stands there under a dead weight of 20 kilograms since seven years. The reason for it is that in the PVB interlayer, there is a fabric reinforcement. Fabric can be done with uh, stainless steel fabrics, for example, with carbon fibers, with nylon fibers, depending on what you want to achieve in addition to the dramatically increased load-bearing behavior of this material. This is a very, very close-up of uh, stainless steel wire mesh embedded in between two layers of PVB, which then are embedded in between the two sheets of glass. If you, for example, take glass fibers, nylon fibers, or comparable materials, which are more or less transparent, you might take advantage of the possibility to illuminate them at night. So this is a certain patterning which we created on a normal fabric weave, which is embedded in between the two sheets of glass. And uh, so at night, for example, you can uh, create a wonderful looking luminescent piece of facade using these technologies, but it is, which at the same time guarantee a dramatically increased post failure stiffness. Working with glass also brought us to the idea to overcome, let's say, the, the problem of an enclosed atrium in the sunny weather conditions where you typically have a dramatically heat up the temperature, which needs a lot of cooling loads, etc., etc. So in that case, which is a, a research laboratory for the for Serono Merck. Serono is the world market leader in fertilizers. We decided together with the architect Helmut Jan the largest operable glass roof in the world. This is 1,000 square meter of glass which move within minutes, noiseless, and open the huge atrium and allow the warm air to swap out or the fresh air to get in. The roof is counterbalanced by a dead weight and is driven, as I already said, noiseless with a pair of uh, hydraulic cylinders. Focusing a little bit on facades, I would have a closer look on this building which is also remarkable because it has no core. It is a composite structure with concrete slabs. But the two buildings are totally independent because the clients wanted to sell them independently. We show the special feature here, these more or less transparent bridges, which are clip-on, clip-off bridges. means they are hung in between the two buildings and they can be replaced by a crane depending on the owner, <coughs> owner's ideas or demands. The building themselves now it becomes critical how it works. As I already said, they have no core, they are very, very lightweight. I think here we went to the border of to the limit of what you can do using composite structures. Each of the building has two U-channeled truss systems which are responsible to take the horizontal load. In between them there are a couple of uh, gravity columns, which can be done relatively slender so that the structure itself does not show any obstacle on the floor level. So sitting here on the one hand, you could look for 70 meters without having any obstacles. So this allows for a lot of flexibility. It allows a lot of transparency. And if we talk about transparency, I would like to focus a little bit more in detail the facade itself. This is the one end of the building, and you see here the diagonals of this U-type truss channel, which is responsible for taking the horizontal loads. And this is the facade, which is a triple glazing, elementized facade of that size. This is a stainless steel cladding with horizontal slots. And behind those horizontal slots, there are operable windows. So everybody can open the window, independent from the weather situation, because the slots are designed in such a way that even if you have a heavy wind loading, the wind does not blow your paperwork away. This is a closer look on this facade. <coughs> Turned 
how to be very, very economical in the energy use to run the building is relatively low. The same, a little bit more advanced. Here we have no operable windows. We have an air intake here, and this air intake is sufficient to supply the, this office behind those two sheets. And of course, the question of uh, where to put the sun louvers, if you have the sun louvers inside, you have the energy in. If you have the sun louvers outside, you have problems with the wind loading. So uh, since there is no sun louver on the market which resists the maximum wind speeds, we introduced the idea to have a double facade, which does nothing else than provide a certain thermal buffer, but uh, the main reason for it is to, uh, to protect the louvers, which are hidden in between the two sheets of the facade. This is the Deutsche Post building in Bonn. A building totally out of gas, 42 story high with a 160 meter high vertical slot which separates the two buildings, the one building into two. This is an atrium, the air is taken in here through the facade, it is conditioned then. The conditioned air is blown into the atrium, goes there to a core structure, we can have a heat exchanger, the energy is recollected and then the dirty air is blown out. This is the facade. This building undergoes the German energy saving court, even if it's all out of gas. So, of course, in Bonn, the former capital of Germany, we don't have that heavy, let's say, sunlight loading as we have here in Dubai. But for Central European region, I think this is a very interesting solution. Of course, having double skin facade is also a cost issue. In order to minimize that, we came up with the idea of an inclined glazing in the facade with a step glazing. So this is an insulated glass here where the upper glass sticks out here. And the only reason for this sticking out is protecting the external louver, which is a stainless steel system, which resists up to 60 to 80 kilometers of wind per hour. A very successful element which we introduced for the first time in that huge size at this uh, Merkzer Uno building too. Of course, all these layerings where you manipulate one or two of those layers in a very unkind way. We have one glass and the blinds inside, which is energy-wise insufficient, where you have two layers of glass and the sun louvers in between, so you already have three layers which you have to clean to run and whatever. It's something one should overcome, and therefore we are heavily working since years on the idea of a switchable glass. We all know that there are a couple of products on the market with switchable glass, but none of those products is able to resist heavy temperature loading, plus as well as minus and heavy UV loading. And the sample you see here, which has been tested for years now under sunlight and weather exposure is absolutely stable. Since it is uh, built up the following way, there are two sheets of glass with a spacing of hundreds of a millimeter. And in this intermediate space, there's a liquid filling which does not freeze under normal condition and which embeds crystals. And those liquid crystals have the, the quality of being bipolar by applying an electric current on an invisible layer on both of the pieces of glass. Plus minus, you are able to direct the crystals. And in the status, they are totally parallel. The situation is the most dark one. In the case of non-electric uh, current, you have the state of maximum entropy, and it's more or less this transparency. The big advantage is that you can switch that and the temperature from minus 30 to plus 95 degrees in real time. But need more or less no energy. Textiles. Another thing we are working on since years and where I see big chance for the buildings in the future since glass as well as the textiles. The big, the most, let's say, interesting steps forward have been done in developing the material for the textiles. Textile skins could yield, for example, high-rise buildings where the facade is not made out of metal or stone or whatever, but simply out of a multi-layer textile product. Architecture-wise, buildings, of course, would have a totally new appearance from inside. Questions have to overcome, for example, acoustic damping, thermal damping, flammability, and things like this. Here, at the new Bangkok International Airport, the architect of which is Helmut Jan, and they did the entire engineering for the so called home forces, which are covered with a special system, especially developed for that uh, airport of 
fabric of skins, we achieved a remarkable energy reduction, as well as at the same time a remarkable acoustic damping. This is a triple layer. The outside layer of fabric is a simple and trivial PPFE coated glass fiber which protects the layers below from the grain. The intermediate layer is a polycarbonate, five millimeter thick plastic element, and the lower layer is a relatively open weave, Teflon coated glass fiber again. And this, in the first time in the world, is covered with a low E coating so that it does not emit heat. The idea then is that uh, by groundwater cooling, the air is pre-cooled and is blown with those elements into the concourses, creating what we call a lake of cold and fresh air. By the way, the energy concept has been done by the firm of Transolar from Stuttgart, our friend Matthias Schuler. And there's this stratification, of course, since there's a lot of warmth produced by the people, for example, and in most upper areas you have up to 50 to 60 degrees. So the material up there is relatively warm, but it does not emit this uh, energy since it has this low E coating. And this is the big advantage, as we all know it, from the flat iron, which does not emit warmth. The question might come up, for example, how do you fix those textiles? onto a substructure. One of the solutions is using vacuum. So this is the first vacuum facade at the world, which we did for an indoor application, where we have a couple of hundreds of square meters of plastic film vacuumized onto a load-bearing grid shell. The structure in total is, I think, 30 to 40 meter high, a long and five to six meter high. It's a single layer grid shell, double curved, and the big question is how do we do the climbing for this exhibition stand? I said the best thing would be having something like a huge piece of silk thrown over the structure. And what we did instead of silk, we used a glass powder blasted plastic film, very, very cheap material. We sealed it here at the lower end. We threw the entire bag over the structure and sealed it again on the other side and then vacuumized it. And the only thing I had to do as the designer to run around and uh, to take care that the folds and wrinkles are in the way I wanted them to have. So the wrinkles here are not an engineering mistake. This is an intention. We will talk about later on about recyclability. This is the first big step into the direction of recyclability because the material has not been glued, bolted, or either one used any fixation, which is, for example, afterwards, once the building reaches its end, difficult to be separated. The success we achieved with this very first vacuum matics, as we call it, made us keen enough to apply the technology on a far larger building, an outdoor application here. This has a clear space inside the box of about 50 by 60 meters. If you go a little bit closer to the building, you won't see any detail. It's like a big piece of butter or plastic or whatever. It's just homogeneous, one color, no bowl, nothing to be seen. It looks like cut out of one piece of plastic. If you go inside, there's a remarkable, wonderful light. And uh, it is a steel structure, which is the main load-bearing structure, and which bridges the span. And on top as well of the bottom of the steel structures and the external walls, we apply the grating. And then we threw a huge piece of fabric over the thing, as well as below it. We sealed it along the edges here, and then we vacuumized it through sucking the fabric onto the gratings. To run the building, it needs a vacuum pump of that size, 10 by 10 centimeters. And the energy needed by the pump is uh, the equivalent of a few square meters of uh, photovoltaics. So this is what we are doing in order to achieve new solutions to work in the field in the day after tomorrow. Sometimes you might say it is not applicable to high-rise buildings and wherever. This might be might be today, but not the day after tomorrow. So therefore, somebody has to be there to research those topics and. Uh, we think uh, it is, uh, as I already said, the most noble job of the university institute and of an engineering office, not to do the things which are already known, but uh, to dig and to research in the field of unknowns. There's an overlayer, and thanks.
an invisible headline that would enter our office, and this is that everything has to be sustainability, but it should not look as a building which is sustainable. We know that in Germany, especially in the 70s and the 80s, when the Green Party came up, there was a slight movement in doing sustainable buildings, which then are typically made out of clay and wood and whatever, and they even look like that. And the people who live in these buildings even look more like that. So our concept is the concept of ecology, yeah? that ecological buildings must be radical modern and radical beautiful with a high aesthetics, so high aesthetics by high ecology. And the, the most radical outcome of this idea is the so-called triple zero concept, which means that the buildings should use zero energy or should even be energy plus buildings that these should be zero emission buildings and that there is zero waste in the recycling phase. Now, all architects and engineers always ask me, why are you permanently talking about the recycling phase? Because we are building for eternity. Typically, eternity ends relatively fast. If you look on the built environment, that there's not too much left from the Egyptians, from the Romans, from the Greeks, and so on. And if you look, for example, at our modern airports, maximum 10 years, after the opening ceremony, there's something built on, rebuilt, modified, or whatever. And in Germany, for example, 60 to 70 percent of the mass waste production is building waste. So there's something with building waste in the field of architecture where we have to resolve a problem, and therefore we talk about recycling. Recycling, or the zero waste concept, means the full recyclability of all building parts and building components, which then dramatically will influence the planning technology as well as the building technology itself. It means that we have easy connect and easy disconnect joints, this is mainly con uh, concerning the planning techniques and the building techniques. It means that we have an easy identifiability of components and materials, so we need those identification systems and of course we need some databases which provide all the full information so that when you want to know what you have in front of you, that you also know who produced it, when was it produced, when was it pro installed, who did the maintenance, and how to recycle that. You might know that the German car industry has by law the so-called take-back guarantee. The law was introduced in 1988, I think, and uh, the law gave the German car manufacturers about 15 years to come up with the technology which enables them to take the cars they sold back and totally recycle them. So for example, every Mercedes, every Porsche, the building components, if I may call it a building, which weigh 100 gram or more, have a barcode or another identification system, which then enables the car producer in a very simple and somehow economic way to take all those pieces of parts. So of course in building industry we could come up with barcodes, but we also could use uh, radio frequency identification systems, which is something we could would prefer, which then would enable you, after years when it comes down to the demolition of that concrete wall by easy identification thing, to know what is the concrete quality, what were the additional materials who produced it, and is there any danger if we recycle it the normal way. By the way, I just wanted to give you that hint. This is the building I'm living in. This is the first triple zero building in the world. It is a house totally made out of glass, which does not use and need any external energy, which has no chimney, means there is zero emission, and which is totally recyclable. All those intentions, all those work to come up with a uh, radical, eco chic sustainable architecture yielded to the foundation of the so-called German Sustainable Building Society, which in German is the Deutsche Gesellschaft für Nachhaltiges Bauen, which became a member of the World Green Building Council. It's a non-profit organization and which deals in six months with the establishment of a certification system for the entire built environment. It means not only for uh, residential buildings or office buildings because this is only 50%. We have to talk also being architects and engineers about streets, about sewage water plants, about
to tunnels and whatnot. So sorry for the technical problems at the very beginning.